Good morning, church family. It is so good to be in the house. Thank you for choosing to come and worship with us today. I, I love that song that we were just singing. Uh, I don't want anyone else. I don't need anything else. I was just over there saying aloud, even in my own heart, Lord, let that be my declaration. And can I just be honest and say, sometimes it's not, but I want it to be. And I love that sometimes we sing things that may not even be true, but personally, but we know it's what needs to be true in our own lives. And so we can declare things with our mouths that we want and we believe that we need to have in our own lives. And man, I was just worshiping in that song, thankful that even at my worst, uh, God still loves me. And uh, we are kicking off a new series entitled um, Games People Play. In this series, we're, we're talking about games that we often all play as a, as a family. Maybe you played them as a kid, or maybe you still have kids and you still play, or maybe you're just a, an a adult that's a kid at heart and you like to bring the people over to the house and uh, play games. Today, we're talking about the game of life, the game of life. Anybody ever played this game before? You can raise your hand if you ever have. Uh, I love this game. Uh, anybody have it at home? Uh, you have it at home. Uh, we're gonna. If you don't have it at home and you got kids, we're gonna have an opportunity at the end of the of the service. Uh, Pastor Vic's gonna give this this particular game right here away. This is the new version, not the old version. If you got the old version, it's a better version. I'm gonna be honest with you, but this is the version that they sell now at Walmart. So this is the version you get. Okay. Um, when I was a kid, one of my favorite things that I would do when I would go to my grandparents, my grandmother and grandfather Costner, my cousins lived in a mobile home right behind their house. And I would sneak off and I would go to their mobile home and, and I would uh, play the game of life. And um, it was the opportunity that I had to listen to my favorite band that my parents didn't let me listen to called the Beastie Boys. Anybody ever listen to the Beastie Boys? <laughs> the License to Ill soundtrack to be exact. So if you know that, then maybe you, you know some good music. Um, I don't know. But the Beastie Boys nonetheless. And uh, how fun is that? Um, let me just tell you the, some of the game rules, if you will, of the game of life. According to the game rules, the game of life, this one says two to four players. The old version said two to six players. How about that? And so you could play with more players. Um, the objective of the game is to collect money and live tiles and have the highest dollar amount at the end of the game. Just for clarity, um, when you're kind of taking your car, you get a car and you get a little person and as you're going through the board, you land on these live tiles and on these live tiles, they are essentially a secret message and they will give you opportunities to make more money. Sometimes you have to draw a card and uh, you actually lose money. But again, the, the object of the game is to get to the end of the game and have the most money and the player with the most money at the end of the game is actually in called the, you know what it is? Winner. How about that? Everybody wants to be a winner. And if you don't have the most money, then you are a loser. That's right. Man, you guys got it. And uh, nobody wants to be the loser. So we all cheat and do everything we can to win. That's just me. Uh, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. Uh, the game of life is a lot like uh, real life at the beginning of the game. Each player must choose his or her pathway. Matter of fact, uh, if, you, if you've played it, again, you know that at the beginning of the game, you actually get to choose, do you want to go ahead and get a job now? And you can go the job route or you can go to college and, and you can go the college route. It's a little bit longer route and you have the opportunity to get some, get, get some tiles that lets you pick from a different job that you know, you have to go to college for. And again, as you go, that gives you a certain amount of money. As you pass the green go section every, every time you go, you're driving down the road, if you will. Um, as the game goes on, you got this little spinner thing here. You spin this wheel and whatever number the spinner lands on is the number of spaces that you you, you go. On some spaces, you have to do what it says to do. On other spaces, you can choose whether or not you're going to do that or not. But the element of choice is key through the whole game. And, and ultimately, again, what happens to you in the game of life depends upon the choices that you make. For instance, you can choose if you, again, want to go to college or go ahead and get a job. You can choose if you want to get married. You can choose if you want to uh, have children. You can even choose if you want to buy 
a house. But again, the goal is to have the most money at the end of the game. And if you have the most money when everyone is done, then you win. The other day, and let me just say this, my family and I love this game. I think because I love this game so much, uh, and so, which is why we're going to kick off this series with it, the game of life. It also just makes sense. We're all in life, and this is the game of life. But uh, we play this about once a week normally. Sometimes it's about three times a week, and so I'll say average out. Maybe I should say uh, once a week. And uh, the other day we were playing as a family, and we got to the point, Ellery got to the point where she had to make the decision, is she going to go the college route or the job route. And if you don't know, my family and I, we have kids, we have five kids ages six to 13, six to 13. Ellery is my 10 year old. And so she decided that she was going to go the college route. And so she, you know, went to the down, down that road, got to the stop sign. And so she ultimately got four cars that she got to choose between one of these careers. And one of the careers that she was, she was just like going crazy. I'm like, what are you so excited about? And she's like, I got my dream job. And, and, and what is it? I said, and she said, it's social media influencer. Okay. And I was like, are you kidding me right now? I mean, if you pick that job, listen to me, you're going to lose because you only get like $40,000 every time you pass the green. And she had an opportunity to pick lawyer, right? Which was like, $80,000 every time you pass. And I was like, don't pick the, the job that you want. Pick the one that you're going to make the most money, right? And my wife was like, honey, we play the game to have fun. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, you may, right? But I play to, to win because if I don't win, guess what I don't have? Fun, okay? <laughs> so uh, I got to win. Um, and as I was playing this silly game that I love, I was thinking about this sermon series, this message, uh, thinking about you guys. And so how about this? How do, how do you do life? Do you play to win? Do you play to have fun? Maybe both. I don't know. Uh, whether you play the game of life or not, we need to know how about this, how to win at life, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, lessons, principles I've learned about life through the game of life. So the title of the message is this, The Game of Life. I know it's real creative, uh, but it is after the game, The Game of Life. Here is the truth, and if you are new to us, I give us a title, I give us a truth, we build upon the truth, and then we come back to the truth at the end. Here's the truth. You can't win if you don't play. You can't win if you don't play. I know it's simple, but it's true. The fact of the matter is this, you will never accomplish what you don't set out to do. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. This is our scripture for the morning uh, our, that's going to kind of encompass this message. Here it is. Uh, Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Here, here's the reality. Not everybody wins but it is possible to win, listen to me, if you know how to play, okay? With that being said, let me pray for us and we're gonna dig into scripture today. Uh, Lord Jesus, we love you. Thanks for this moment, this opportunity to get to come and, and gather as a church family to, to lean in, to worship to you and, and, and Lord, hear from your word. And so God, I pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would speak to us that if there's anything in this message that, that is of me and not of you, Lord, would you, would you somehow miraculously, mysteriously just change it in, in midair so that your people will hear what you want them to hear so that they can walk away encouraged today. Lord, I thank you for everyone that gathered uh, today. Lord, I thank you for our, our mission team that's in the field. Lord, I thank you for our students that are, that are getting back and reacclimating from Falls Creek and all the adults that went. Lord, I thank you for just how good you really are to us. And so, Lord, um, would you speak to us now? In your goodness, Lord, make us more like you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, we're gonna be looking at three principles, again, that I have learned about life through the game of life. Three principles I've learned about living life from the game of life. Here's principle number one. It's actually the longest principle, so just kind of stick with me as we work through it. Here it is, you have to take risk. You have to take risk risk. In the game, you have the opportunity from time to time to take risk on various things. And I'm not trying to brag, but I do win at this game a lot. Now, um, 
I was talking to my family. They came Wednesday night, and they were kind of disputing that. And I said, well, when did you beat me? You hear what I'm saying? And so they couldn't think of a time. And so I just, I've went a lot, okay? I just want you to know that. They're over here, little, you know, like a peanut gallery. So, uh, but I went a lot. And, but I've never won, how about this, without taking risk. And you have the opportunity within the game to take risk. Matter of fact, you can land on this one tile and it's called the invest tile. And what you do when you land on the invest tile, you have an opportunity to, to spend like 50,000 bucks and choose one of these numbers. And then anytime a, another player lands on the number, then the bank gives you money. Now, I always invest in number eight because that's what they land on the most. I don't know why. That's just where it lands. And, and because of that, listen to me, I have won a lot. I'm not, I'm not lying. I have won a lot, okay? You can also take a risk um, with the house because not all the houses that you buy in this game actually have a reward at the end. Some actually lose value. And so I don't take a risk on the houses that I think is going to lose value. I only take a risk on the ones that I think will gain value. But again, it's impossible, how about this, to win it if at some point in this game you don't take a risk. In life, there are moments that you need to take risk. Um, some of those risks for some of us have paid off big and good and others have been uh, difficult. Um, I, I have trusted a friend in the past, how about this, and with certain, you know, just, I guess, information about my life back in the day, right, who I had a crush on or whatever, and then when I was betrayed, I was hurt. Uh, I've trusted in other relationships. Um, when Alice and I first got married, we lived in Nashville, Tennessee. We bought our first house um, near... Um, the Opryland Hotel. Anybody know where that is in, in, in Nashville? And uh, we, we lost. We lost $8,000 when we sold that house. And uh, man, we were sick. 8,000 uh, bucks. But, but just as bad as it hurts when we lose at risk, right? It also feels good when we win. Matter of fact, um, how about this? I took a risk on Allison and I won. You hear what I'm saying? Uh, uh, she said it was a sure bet. But... Uh, I took a risk on trusting Pastor Rick in coming to this church because we have experienced, just to be blunt with you, some church hurt and trauma. And, and I didn't really even know how I felt about church much anymore. And yet we took a risk. And in this church, you all, and Pastor Rick has been such a blessing to my family. Thank you for, lo for loving us. This has been one of the best risks that we have taken as a family together. And we love being here um, we've, we've lost and we've, we've won. I know you have lost and you have won. Um, how about this? Learning who you can trust and what you can trust makes all the difference when it comes to taking risk. I have learned that I can't always trust my feelings, but I can always trust God's word to lead me and guide me into truth. And so what I thought I would do for the remainder of this first section on uh, you have to take risk is just give you six reasons why you can risk it all on God's word, okay? Um, we don't always, as a church family, I think, look back to why can we trust the, the Bible and why, do we, why is this our, our um, only, I would say this, even primary resource that we look to, to learn and grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus. But I'm gonna give you six reasons today that if maybe you don't trust Jesus, maybe you're, you're here, maybe you're watching online and you're like, I don't know if I can really trust God's word. I just wanna give you six reasons why you can trust God's word today, why you can bet the farm on God's word. These aren't necessarily new to me. I have seen these, read these over time, but I wanted to compile them you may can think of more, uh, but I got six uh, just in brevity so that we can walk through them. Why you can trust God's words. Here, here's the first one, internal consistency. The Bible contains 66 books written by over 40 different authors in three different languages over the course of how about this, 1,500 years. And together, every single one of these books all, by all these different authors paint a, a picture, a consistent picture of one story that revolves around God creating men and women, us sinning against God and God making a way through the restoration of, how about this, of all things by his grace through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All these authors, all that time, one consistent theme, the gospel of Jesus. It is internal internally consistent. Number two, manuscript reliability. 
Uh, I thought this was interesting. Um, we base our knowledge of world history on writings where we have a handful, a handful of manuscripts, sometimes a few hundred. But, but for the Bible, listen to this, there are over 5,000 full or partial manuscripts, manuscripts of the Greek New Testament and more manuscripts are found every, every year. None of which, and I think this is important to note, have ever made, how about this, a major revision to scripture. They've all been that consistent and that, that closely related that there's been no major revision off of the, the manuscripts in all of the manuscripts that we continue to find as it relates to God's word. It is, the manuscript is reliable. Historical accuracy. Over and over again, the Bible has been proven historically, geographically, and archeologically accurate. One, and I think this is interesting, one Christian non-Jewish, which means they have no dog in the fight. Do you know what I mean? Th- listen to what this individual says. It may be stated categorically that no archeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference ever. Ever. Fulfilled prophecy, the Bible contains thousands of prophecies fulfilled with uncanny precision, including 300 specific prophecies in the Old Testament written over hundreds of years that are fulfilled in detail in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The odds of that happening are, how about this, uh, uh, less than one in 2,000 zeros. The probability of all these prophecies being accurate, less than one in 2,000 zeros. And I, and I was like, well, I don't even know. I'm not really a math dude. Like, I, I, don't, I don't really know what that means it looks like. So I looked it up like, what, what's that probability? Listen to this probability. Do you guys know what a silver dollar coin is? Silver dollar coin. It, it would, this, is, this is the likelihood of this probability. You're putting an X on one, okay? You're filling the state of Texas with two feet of silver dollar coins, throwing one out blindfolding the guy, asking the guy to walk out into the middle of Texas, wherever they want, and, and, and bend down, and when they pick up, it'd be the silver dollar with the X on it. That is that probability. And yet, listen, what seems to be improbable happened with Jesus Christ. <laughs> we have fulfilled prophecy. Eyewitness testimony. People were writing down what they saw when they saw it happening. And you know what? This is interesting to me. And as I was thinking through this, and there were a lot of people around watching what took place. And you know what? None of them disputed what was being said when they said it. Think about that. The only people that dispute God's word are people now who have no clue what happened then because they didn't live then. No one disputed it then. Listen, um, do, you, do you guys know who Blaise Pascal is? Um, if, you, if you are... A math nerd, uh, he created the calculator. How about that? If maybe you're in the medical field, he created the syringe. Um, Maybe you're a country folk, you just like to have a good time. He also created, how about this? The roulette wheel. The roulette wheel, if you like that. I don't know. But I'm just saying, just to let you know what he said. Listen to what he said, though. Um, He said, and I think this is good, I believe those witnesses that got their throats cut. (laughs) Supernatural authenticity. Number six, the Bible, again, was written by 40 authors who were inspired by the Holy Spirit throughout history. In every age and place where this book has gone, it has supernaturally changed lives. In every century that it has been shared and read and preached, uh, thousands and thousands of people's lives have been changed for the better. Can I just say this? And even if, 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 if I say, I don't know if I trust anybody else, about God's word. Can I just say this? I trust me because this book has changed my life. And as I've done my best to get over me and apply what is written in this word, and I don't always do it great. I need you to hear me. But when I do everything I can to get past me and over me to apply what God's word has said in my life, then listen, I have always, and I come out different. I am changed. I am changed who I used to be. And it's not because I worked hard. It's because the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in me that I received as I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior has moved in and through his word and done things in me that I couldn't do on my own. So here's how I want to end this principle. If if you came here today or maybe you're even watching online and you're wondering how you feel about Jesus in the Bible, let me encourage you. You can take God's word to the bank. I love what Psalm uh, 33, 4 says, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Here's my point for you in this section. God's word is God's word, and it's safe to bet the farm on what God's word reveals. So here's my question. Do you trust God's word? 
Have you risked it all on what this book says? And if you haven't, can I just ask you, why would you not take that risk? This is the safest bet you'll ever make by trusting, listen to me again, God's word. Principle number two, uh, you don't win just because you finish first. In the game of life, how about this? If you actually get through the board the fastest, uh, then the likelihood of you winning is actually a whole lot less. Matter of fact, in our house, who, went, who gets through first actually has always lost. It's just true. And he, here's why that's true. Because when you get through fast, like you're, that means you're, like, you're, you're spinning tens the whole time or whatever, you know what I mean? It, you've missed a lot of opportunity to have a lot of experiences that actually made you a lot of money. That's just true for the game of life. Okay, and let me say this. Um, I often love to quote Talladega Nights. Anybody who's seen the Talladega Nights? And, um, and in that movie, there's a quote that says, if you ain't first, you're last. But, but that's not true. It's not only not true here, but it's not true according to God's word. Matter of fact, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. He says, the last shall be first. So let me help principle number two make some sense for us. I've had a history of winning the hills in front of me, but looking back and being the only one standing on the hill with a lot of dead people in my wake. I can't tell you how often I've started with people around me and ended up on top of the hill again by myself. I've been so driven. I I, I hate to tell you this. I've been so driven in my life and my past that I wanted to accomplish things and I did everything I could as hard as I could, as fast as I could and didn't take time and slow down and enjoy not only the people around me, but my family that's around me. And even though I have finished some things first, I've missed a lot of opportunities that I can't take back and in some ways I lost. I love that as a church, one of the things that we say every Wednesday night and every Sunday morning, it really comes back to this whole relationship thing, is that we know that quality of life is based on the quality of the relationships we have with God and those around us. And let me just say this. If we're moving too fast in life, that we cannot enjoy our family and the people around us, and trust me, people, we are moving too fast. If you're moving so fast, if you're, if you're that gung-ho and ambitious and you miss the relationships around you, if you miss the experiences that God is placing in your life, listen, then you're moving too fast. One of the songs that I, I love to listen to, one of the artists I like, um, anybody like country music? Some of y'all do. Uh, there's a country music uh, singer named Jamie Johnson. Anybody listen to him? He's got a song out. I just, this is going to be an application for you today. I want you to go home and listen to it. Uh, it's called The Dollar, okay? It's a song called The Dollar, and I want you to, I, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, as you drive home, even listen to it with your family. Um, it's all about slowing down and not missing the opportunities that are right there in front of us. And can I, I just know this to be true. I, I know that because I know how incredible all of you are, that, that, a lot of you are so ambitious and you do so well at so many things that you, that you may have missed some of the most important things around you, which is your family. Men, listen to me. If you're so ambitious about work that you're doing everything you can to, to make it at work, to, 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 to actually promote, and you miss spending time with your wife and pouring into her and your, ki- and your kids, then you're not winning, you're losing. Women, if you're doing everything you can to promote and, and to experience all the extra things of life and you're not taking time to, to enjoy your, your man and your children, they listen to me, you're not winning, you are losing. You're losing. Um, slow down. Slow down. And enjoy the relationships that God brings us. Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through four, encourages us, I love this, to throw off the weights and sins that hold us back and run, listen, not as fast as you can, but with endurance. Run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, which brings us to really the point of this section, and here it is. In life, the goal is to persevere together, not to beat everyone else. Focus on 
the relationships. Here's some questions. Are you winning at the relationships in your life? Are you winning? Do you find yourself alone? Or listen, building on what we started off principle one, have you trusted God's word enough to know that God's word says that we must live in biblical community. And so not only are you trusting God's word, but you're doing everything you can to live according to his word, which means slowing down and resting in the promise that God will give you everything that you need. It is our responsibility to listen, to enjoy the relationships around us. Principle number three, the game of life is short. Um, some of, some of you may think it's a long time to play the game of life if you've ever played it before. Um, I talked to someone Wednesday night. They said it takes them about 45 minutes to do it. Hey, look, in the scheme of things, if it's 45 minutes, that's nothing, okay? And uh, the game of life is kind of short. And let me just say this, so is life. So is life. Um, G- James, which is Jesus' brother, this is right after Jesus died. He wrote this about life, and I, I think it's just so interesting. He says this in James 4, 14. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. What is life? This is after he just lost his brother. Too soon, I might add. He said, what is it? You know, when I think about the anger that I feel in my life, and that I wrestle with, if I'm just being completely vulnerable, I think one of the things that makes me just so angry the most is that I've lived my life uh, like I had more time. And I've missed a lot of the important relationships in my life all because I was so focused on winning and, and, and being just accomplishing goals and dreams and wishes that I've, I've, I've ran past everything that I would even say I, I, I love and matter. I've spent so much of my time working to promote that I forgot to take care of the relationships around me. And so when I think about the people that I love the most that have died, I think about my dad. My dad's been dead about seven years. And can I say, I, I wish that, that I would have taken the time, settled down, slowed down to learn more from his wisdom that he had. I mean, my dad was in ministry. He, he mentored a lot of ministers, but you know who he didn't, who he didn't mentor because I didn't give him the time? Me. I thought I knew more than he did. I wish I had the time to go back and and apologize for some of the things that I don't know if he really ever got over that I said to him. When I think about my grandfather Costner, my grandfather Costner was in a long-term care facility. And and, and I don't know, I guess he just forgot he would call like every other hour. Do you know what I mean? Um, And it would, we'd be so annoyed that he called so much. We'd be like, oh my gosh, it's your your grandpa again. And and sometimes we'd pick up, sometimes we'd just let the phone ring. And uh, I, I wish I would have picked up one more time. When my grandmother Costner died, she had Alzheimer's. And, um, she was in, a, a, again, a, an Alzheimer's unit at a long-term care facility. And, and you know, one of the last times she, I went, I, she didn't really recognize me. And so I didn't even go back. And I wish I could go back one more time. I always thought I had more time. And yet I didn't. And can I just say, I I know that everybody in this room and that's watching online, all of us have had people that we lost that we just thought we would have more time. But the game of life is short. It's short. Don't let life end before you tell the people around you that you love them. Don't let life end before you take the opportunities that you've been given to share the gospel with the people that's in your life that, so that they can know the truth and be freed of the sin and the junk in their life and have the freedom to live eternally with him in heaven. You know, it is possible, it is possible to end life and not have unfinished business. But listen to me, you have to put in the work and get in the game and start now. Start now. In the game of life, there's uh, always one winner. Everybody else are losers. But in real life, listen to me, 
everybody has an opportunity to win. When you trust his word. When you lean into biblical community. And you realize that we're not given tomorrow and you make much of today. Trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And sharing him with all your friends. Listen, it's possible to win. It's possible to win, but you can't win if you don't play. And I want you to win. And you can. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for this this day. Lord, I thank you for just giving us the opportunity to gather, to to hear a message revolving around a, Lord, a silly game, the game of life. And God, I pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit that for everyone in this room, that, Lord, that they would have heard your voice. They would know exactly how you would want them to respond. And then, Lord, they would just trust you at your word and do it. Lord, thank you for this time that we've had this morning to slow down and spend time with you. You're so good to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.